uh, Luke Burglar's farm just outside of Ridgeway, Minnesota. We're actually in a field today that uh, has a, a really nice CRI cover crop. This field was planted to 60 inch corn rows and so what we're looking at is you know really stacked in here corn plants and we're trying to uh, open up the canopy to try to grow some forage for later in the fall for grazing purposes but also to stimulate the biology and add diversity. Luke's growing corn, soybeans, hay, lots of diverse cover crop mixes that he's taking to grain, also that he's grazing. A lot of his acres are getting cover crop after his corn and soybean harvest. A fair amount of the farm is actually rotationally grazed as well. So again, we're in a field that was cover crop last fall after soybean harvest uh, with cereal rye. You can see that here. Luke had really good luck last year interseeding on 30 inch corn rows and so he wanted to try a, a small amount of acres where he planted 60 inch rows. You're still planting about the same population per acre but you don't have obviously as many rows and so the corn plants are much closer stacked together so instead of four to five inches, five and a half, six even, they're down to that three inch mark. So we have essentially double the population. So these corn plants are stacked in here really tight two and a half three inches you know compared with the normal you know closer to five inches the idea is to let more light get down through the canopy and then grow a, a diverse cover crop mix in between the rows and we call that interseeding and so luke is out here today with his rotary hoe and gandy airbox planting in that diverse mix. I think it's like a 15-way mix. And so we're here to look at kind of how it looks here, uh, middle of June, 2020. Luke has been doing cover crops off and on, I think for about four years. He's also migrated to more of a no-till system and trying to get away from you know tillage or reduced tillage. So much of his farm has been no-till for the last couple years. He's been growing lots of different cover crops behind the grain crops, but also with the grain crops. You know, here we're growing corn for grain, but we're also gonna try to grow some forage to graze later on this fall. And last year, I know he extended his grazing season by about a month by interseeding. And he also fed the biology. He's trying to you know, heal his soil at the same time. Those are part of the reasons that he's out here interseeding and trying 60 inch corn. Here I have a chunk of soil, and what I kind of wanted to point out is what we call a macro pore here. This is the, the night crawler that um, came out of that hole. And so when we reduce tillage or eliminate it, we're able to keep these conduits or these culverts that allow water uh, from the surface to get down into our soil. And that's really important for water infiltration, uh, but also cycling nutrients. Again, this is, this is the, our friend, our free friend that created that if we build the habitat for them. Um, and so by reducing tillage or eliminating it, try to go into no-till, we keep all these culverts and these conduits to keep getting water into our soil profile. This soil is healing. It's still got some uh, blocky structure to it, uh, some platiness to it from past years of tillage. You can see how it's breaking across that, those planes as I, as I crush the, the sample here. And so, we eventually want it to be very crumbly and show us that it has some aggregate stability and kind of break apart as cottage cheese. Um, but right now, you know, because we've, this farm has had some, you know, 50 plus years of tillage, we're, we're still seeing that in the soil profile, but we're trying, to, we're trying to fix that. Again, we're trying to take the soil that we've been given, take care of it and heal it. We're doing that with lots of live roots, uh, diverse roots in the soil profile that are obviously going down further and you know communicating with the soil, the microbiology, the underground herd as we call it. So here we have what we would call more like micropores. So these aren't as big as what we call a macropore, but they also are smaller pores that allow water and air again to get down in the soil profile. And water is really uh, helpful. Uh, when we go to a no-till system, we generally increase our infiltration rates exponentially and so it's because of these friends and also the macropores that allow us to do that to have the water cycle um, improving but then also the mineral cycle improving as well and the availability of our nutrients to our cash crop in our pasture systems that all those types of things 
So on this field right now, we have uh, a CRI cover crop that was planted late last year. I want to say late October, first week of November, around, I think that's 60, 70 pound mark to the acre. So here we have a um, pretty solid stand of Sierra rye that was seeded last year. And it's providing really nice armor between the rows. And that armor is really essential for moisture retention, also rainfall impact hitting the, you know, it can't hit the soil surface, it hits this and kind of absorbs the shock of the raindrops and then allows it easier to soak into the soil. This cover crop, when it lays down, will act as insulation, it'll keep the sun off the soil, and so the soil will stay more moist, which means more available water for the plants. And it also creates a, basically what we call a skin that again, kind of protects or armors the soil, which is really important for our soil life, the underground herd, which we're really trying to focus more and more on, the soil microbiology, which is really helpful as we wanna try to have more resilient soils and be less dependent on synthetic inputs, fertilizers, sprays, that type of thing. One of the main objectives of having a cover crop is to have weed suppression. And so because the cover crop is shading the soil, there's much less uh, potential for those weeds to germinate and express themselves. So that is a big uh, benefit of having cover crops is weed suppression. And then this spring, Luke actually waited a bit to plant his corn. I think it was a couple weeks later, waiting for soil temperatures to get up closer to that 55 degree mark with warm weather coming, as well as decent moisture. And so then he no-till planted into this CRI, so that would be called planting green. And then I think it was about a week and a half or two weeks ago, he terminated the CRI cover crop with a herbicide to kill it. But this cover crop has provided really good weed suppression. So when you look down, there's very few broad leaves that are coming up because of the cover crop. So that's been a benefit. Next step would be again, today we're out here interseeding with the rotary hoe and gandy. And now Luke is coming in with a pretty diverse mix of kind of an annual ryegrass based mix with his interseeding. Various clovers like a medium red clover, I believe a crimson, some buckwheat, I think cow peas is in the mix as well. He has a diverse mix of cover crop species that he's hoping to grow in between the corn rows. And right here we're in 60 inch corn, he's also doing it kind of farther behind me towards the farmstead in 30 inch rows. We're out here experimenting on the 60 inch rows. This is the first time that Luke has, has grown 60 inch rows. The main advantage is, again, trying to have diverse cover crops that are feeding the soil microbiology, but then also kind of the main objective is to provide food for his cow herds. Last year he grazed for an extra month without having to be on stored feed because he had really good forage between the rows in his cornfields. There is some risk. Weed control can be an issue because we are opening the canopy and if we don't get a good weed control as far as a chemical burn down, we can have more weeds show up as well but a lot of studies have shown we're able to maintain yield with between 60 and 30 inch rows. And then we'll let the corn canopy and then harvest it for grain. After the corn is combined, I believe Luke's plan is to kind of strip graze this off. And it'll depend on how much rain we get and how well the covers do over the summer here. The plan would be to take a couple of these fields and subdivide them and then let the cows take the radishes and the clovers, the annual ryegrass, the turnips, all those things and eat them for forage. So he's not having to feed hay up at his building site or somewhere out here on the cropland or pasture. So there's some benefits to be gained that aren't necessarily yield driven, but when we look at return on investment and net profit per acre, there's some significant gains there because then we not only are feeding the soil biology, but we're also providing forage for this cow herd that we can utilize into fall or even into winter if we stay open with snowfall. That's what we have going on here. So Luke, like I said, is in this journey, I think this is his fourth year of trying cover crops and reducing tillage. He's been also trying frost seeding the last, I think, three years with his Gandhi air box in Rotary Hole. Obviously that's not in the ground, but he uses that to frost seed. He's also planted into rye that's four or five foot tall, planted his soybeans directly into that green. So there's a lot of different things that him and his friend Mike Steinfeld have been doing over the last couple of years kind of together.